January 2005, we boarded the MV Explorer, our home for the next 100 days. The voyage would take us to 10 ports around the world with 150 faculty and staff, 650 students, and 100 crew as part of the Semester at Sea Study Abroad program. Matt was IT director, and I one of two mental health counselors. Our itinerary included departure from San Diego, picking up students in Vancouver, BC, then on to Korea, Japan, China, Hong Kong, India, Kenya, South Africa, Brazil, Venezuela, and returning to Fort Lauderdale. You see that lightning bolt in the middle of the North Pacific? That's what our story is about. After mildly rough sailing from San Diego with faculty and staff, we're trained for four days, we picked up the students in Vancouver. We departed on a cold, rainy, dreary night. Looking back, it was a sign of what the rest of the 10 days would bring. As we left the Straits of Juan de Fuca and entered the open ocean, we were immediately hit by stormy seas that knocked over plants, threw books off the library shelves, and made meals a difficult adventure. At least a third of the shipmates became seasick, and barf bags were placed all around for convenient use. And now the third day on the open ocean, we awoke to find our grand piano, which had been bolted to the floor, flipped over on its back. Although it was another ominous sign this was not what we signed up for, we adjusted to this new reality. Classes went on with students sitting on the floor as chairs were now dangerous projectiles. The violent motion of the ship for days on end made for sleepless and dangerous nights as drawers and closet doors banged open and shut and TVs and other items, including bodies, flew about the room. Students resorted to sleeping in hallways and common areas for safety. All of us were forced to lurch around like drunken sailors. Naively, we didn't know things could get worse. This image is of the wave height forecast for the North Pacific around January 26th. The red dot indicating our position also happens to be on the international dateline, forever bringing into question the actual day that this story took place. <laughs> At 6 a.m. on the 26th, we heard very unwelcome announcements. We had taken a blow to the bridge from a wave that was higher than the ship, blowing out windows and disabling and destroying the equipment you see. We were dead in the water for 45 minutes in 60-foot seas without propulsion, navigation, or communication with the outside world. Be broadside to the waves and 116 knot winds, the ship began heaving 50 degrees to starboard and port. Passengers donned life vests and gathered in the hallways. We held onto our bunks, pretending this was not really happening. We were surprised we stayed so calm. Looking back, we think that the silence of the engines, the sound of the mournful foghorn, and the shrieking wind all combined to short circuit our rational fears. <laughs> Passengers were assembled in the muster station, and the crew directed the men to separate from women and children in case of what would likely be a fruitless evacuation. Two hours later, the chief engineer had hot-wired the second engine. We then put the storm at our stern, although still in great danger. Well, what were we thinking at that time? We were terrified, but we had a depressing realization. All that chocolate and comfort food we're saving for the entire trip was going to the bottom of the ocean to be eaten by unintelligent marine life. Why didn't we eat it sooner? As soon as we got back to our rooms, we ate all the chocolate. Life lesson, don't save the chocolate. The interior of the ship was devastated. The bookstore, galley, clinic, rooms, library, glass tables, all were severely damaged. We were in shock and not entirely sure what had just happened to us. The captain turned the ship toward Hawaii for safe harbor and repairs. Japan and Korea were off the itinerary and the remainder of the voyage in question. We limped into Hawaii five days later, accompanied by Coast Guard and tugboats and nearly depleted of fuel. We were welcomed by cameras, reporters, and curious residents. Crisis intervention teams boarded only to find out that the shipboard community had pretty much worked it all out over the last few days. We were temporarily over it and only seeking terra firma. 
The ship was badly damaged, including bow plates, engines, electronics, and structural beams. The stars show the blown out windows. The box indicates Matt and Julie's cabin, which was completely underwater many times. The decision was made to do essential repairs in Hawaii while we were flown to China, Hong Kong, and Vietnam. Almost four weeks after our arrival in Hawaii, we were reunited with our repaired ship. We were all surprised at how excited we were to see her sailing up the Saigon River. Among all passengers, only 10 abandoned the voyage, three due to injuries. After having been flown across East Asia for two weeks, the shipboard family was finally reunited. We were on that ship for 90 more days, allowing ample time to process what had happened to us. It was a constant and vigorous topic of conversation and debate. I had to reconstruct my computer lab, and Mary saw her share of traumatized students and adults who knocked on her door all hours of the day and night. Back home, I remember the first time that I went skiing off the Lone Peak Tram, shown at the top. I realized the slope of that run is about the same as that of the ship when it was listing over at its worst. <laughs> and driving by the Baxter Hotel right down the street here, shown at the bottom, I realized the wave that disabled our vessel was about the same height as that building. Every year, the six of us get together and celebrate what we call Wave Day on January 26th. We came close to missing high school and college graduations, um, an acceptance in a nursing school, and a wedding. We've been taught so many life lessons, but the, one of the more memorable ones is don't save the chocolate. Thanks so much for listening to our story.